and the two characters with this book I'm trying to do something a little more commercial than the other books I've done um, because I'd like to make more money <laughs> and um, so uh, th this book of stories there are three stories in here about these two men called Fletcher and Harry and Fletcher is this fairly serious guy he's, uh, he's into computer science he's a mathematician you know. and uh, he's he, he was running a business and trying to make you know make make a living at this. And his friend Harry uh, was this sort of out of it genius. Like, like it's sort of a traditional team in science fiction: the entrepreneur and the genius. And you know Harry never is always kind of out of it, doesn't know what he's doing. The Fletcher is out of it in his own way. And together, you know, they they always get these wonderful inventions, and it never works out. <coughs> they always end up at the end of the story poorer than they were at the beginning. And so. This is just starting out. So this, in the, the last, you don't really have to have read the stories that come before, but at this point, they're both, they were bankrupt and so on. And so it just starts out here. Master of Space and Time, Chapter 1. My screen began flashing. I had the console rigged to measure quitting time to the nanosecond. Softech had a flexi time system, which meant that you could quit after putting in 40 hours. A few quick key punches, and I logged off for the weekend. I yawned and looked around the too familiar room. I was pretty old to be working this time. A couple of years ago I'd had it made, my own company and my own signature on the paychecks, but now? Finished so soon, Dr. Fletcher? It was my supervisor, an angular young woman named Susan Lacey. Dr. Lacey. No one used first names in soft tech. Got me policy. No, I'm not finished, but I've clocked in my 40 hours. It's Friday afternoon. She flashed her human relations smile. It's 2.47 Friday afternoon, Dr. Fletcher. I don't have to tell you that you were there in an awful rush for your program. You know how anxious they do get. They. Lacey was always talking about her higher-ups as if it were her and us programmers against some abstract and personal them. It was her way of trying to win our sympathy, even though she was a slave driver. A pathetically transparent con job. I wished I could be my own boss again. I was too good for this nervous. Don't worry. I snapped shut my briefcase. The deadline's Monday afternoon. I'll bring the thing in under the wire. I always do, you know. All around me, my co-workers were still tapping away at their terminals. I was the only one with the nerve to take flexi time seriously. I'd never move up the soft tech corporate ladder, but so what? All I needed at this point was a steady paycheck. Soon I'd be able to get my engineering firm back on its feet. I gave Lacey a curt nod and headed for the parking lot. It was a hot day in late September. Buzzing around the trash cans were hornets, drunk with the summer's fatness. My car was the biggest on the lot. I had a black and white 1956 Buick, black on the bottom and white on top. Little Serena called it Dada's saddle shoe. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I just got a car like this. I bought it just before Fletcher and Company went bankrupt as a final present to myself. The guy I bought it from had gotten it off the original owner little old lady who only drove it to church. No lie. <laughs> As I unlocked my big old bomb, I noticed some things moving around in there. Bees? The biggest one was perched right on top of the white plastic steering wheel. But that was no bee. A wave of strangeness swept over me, a thick airless feeling as if the world had suddenly turned into a giant movie set. Harry Gerber was sitting on my steering wheel. He was two inches tall. A much smaller version of him was perched on the gear shift as well. And the tiny dots darting around on my dashboard, something told me they were a flock of yet tinier Harrys. All of them wore gray polyester suits, white shirts, and no neckties. Oh my. Who else but Harry? Harry Gerber, the out of a genius who'd been the inventor at Fletcher and Company. We'd had some wild times together, Harry and me, but now I hadn't seen him for over a year. He'd had a big fight with my wife, Nancy, at our first child's christening, and after that, we drifted apart. He lived in New Brunswick, and I lived in Princeton. The little figure on the steering wheel hailed me with a cheerful wave of its tiny arm. Hey, Fletch! Pretty slick, huh? He sounded like Mickey Mouse. <laughs> I glanced over my shoulder to see if anyone from Soft Tech was watching. Buzzing hornets and thick, sweet sun. I got in my car and closed the door. I took the thumb-sized Harry off my steering wheel and set him down on the dashboard. I pincered the ant-sized Harry off the gear shift and put him next to the other one. There are too many of the even smaller ones to count. You know when a mathematician says that, he means infinitely many. <laughs> I didn't want to come out and say it. There are too many of the even smaller ones to count. They stood there in a row, staring at me. Why all the copies, Harry? The 
others are like correction terms, said the thumb-sized man. <laughs> a convergent series. <laughs> You've been reading The Cat and the Hat Comes Back, haven't you? Yeah, I was reading it to little Serena last night. I didn't bother asking how Harry knew. You must be thinking about the scene where the cat has a smaller cat in his hat, and the smaller cat has a yet smaller cat in his little hat, and the yet smaller cat is a still smaller cat, and so on forever, right? You're a rational man, Fletcher. Here, catch my act. Each little Harry squatted down by the next smaller one. The big one, the thumb-sized Harry, stuck some fingers in his mouth and attempted a sharp whistle. It came out a wet hiss. But this was enough. The smallest Harry I could see, a speck-sized one, jumped into the coat pocket of the next larger one, a flea-sized Harry. The flea-sized Harry jumped into the coat pocket of the ant-sized Harry. The ant-sized Harry jumped into the coat pocket of the thumb-sized Harry. They nested themselves together like Chinese boxes. I wondered how many levels there were. You like it better now? I like it better. Aren't you going to ask me how I got this way? I figured you'd tell me if you could. A frustrating aspect of Harry's inventions was that he rarely understood how they worked. He was like some drunken chef who never writes down a recipe. This idiosyncrasy of Harry's had prevented Fletcher and company from getting patents on any of his inventions and had eventually made people unwilling to contract with him. I needed some money, Fletcher, a few thousand. I've come back here to make sure you really came to see me tomorrow. I remember that when you showed up tomorrow, you're going to say you'd seen me tiny in your car. This was a very strange mixture of tenses. I thought for a minute and got the picture. You mean you're from the future? You've invented time travel? The little man on the dashboard looked suddenly haggard. Time travel's nothing compared to what I can really do. I'm master of space and time. I fought back a lamp. Dumpy, rope-lipped Harry, the king of creation. Do you write that with capital letters, Harry? Master of space and time. It's not funny. I've got powerful enemies, Fletcher. Please come see me tomorrow. I'll be at the shop. Here. The little figure tossed something at me, a tiny stick of dynamite, bright red and with a wispy, unlit fuse. Slowly, slowly, the little red stick tumbled through space. Something was wrong with my time perception. It was as if the world were grinding to a halt. The dynamite hovered in the air, and Harry was shrinking, moving away from me in some unknown dimension. Everything was getting dark. Use the dynamite to get loose from the loop. Harry's voice faded, and the world went black, blacker than night. Zero the photon. I fumbled around, found the knob, and turned on my headlights. I could see outside, but I couldn't figure out what I was looking at. My car seemed to be resting on black filth front of a soft, horizontally grooved wall. There was more black cloth to the left of me, and to the right there was a cliff with a big white pole swooping up from its edge. White plastic with sebaceous cracks. The scene made no sense whatsoever. Although my dome light wasn't on, the inside of my car was lit up. I glanced around to find the cause. Resting on the seat next to me, there was a sort of toy car, a scale model 1956 Buick with blazing headlights. The headlights were aimed at my corduroy-clad right leg. It looked as if the little car even had a model driver. I put my hand on it, then drew back with a scream. Just as my thumb touched the wraparound windshield of the model car, a giant's hand had swooped down out of the darkness to press its hand-like thumb against my own windshield. When I withdrew my hand, the giant followed suit. I leaned down to peer into the model car's side window. Inside, I could make out a very strange sight. Sitting on the front seat of the model car was a still smaller model, and peering into the window of the still smaller model was a thumb-sized little copy of me, Joseph Fletcher. The hair on my neck crinkled as I realized that, staring in through my own car's window, it must be the eye of a giant Joe Fletcher. I whirled around, hoping to see the giant's eye, but he turned as fast as I did. All I could see of him was the cheek of his huge head. He had whirled to stare out the window of his car, the giant car whose seat my own car was resting. I could see beyond his cheek and out his window, out there was the head of a yet larger giant, and so on and on, forever up and down. I was embedded in a doubly infinite regress. I had to escape. <laughs> How do you think you can get out? I flung open my car door and jumped out. I found myself on the seat of the giant's car. Peering out the giant's car's door, I could see the giant standing on the seat of a yet larger car, and staring at, at a yet larger giant. Looking back into my own car, I could see the little model on the seat, 
and the thumb-sized Fletcher standing next to it and staring back in at the ant-sized Fletcher on the model seat. No matter how fast I turned, I could never see myself face to face. I threw myself back into my seat and turned on the radio. Static crackled from my radio, and from the endless radios beyond and within my car. Static, and then a voice, a strangely familiar voice. A strangely familiar voice, said the radio. <laughs> <laughs> And this is one of these things, actually I have no idea what that is on the radio. <laughs> Later in the book there'll be a reason, you know, but you just have to leave his hands and get so it doesn't matter what it is. Later I'll know who it is, but I don't know now. Hi, I called questioningly. The giant Fletcher outside shouted with me, and from the tiny car in the seat came thumb-sized Fletcher's squeak. <laughs> Harry had spoken of powerful enemies. Maybe the strangely familiar voice on the radio was a powerful enemy. You've pinched off into this endless up and down readers. But why? What's your name? I am. Please help me get out. Cheating already. Boom bye. <laughs> Silence fell. After a minute I flicked off the radio. Just as something bounced off my cheek. It was the miniature dynamite stick Harry had just thrown at me. Time was all messed up. I picked up the dynamite and struck a match. The larger and smaller Fletchers did the same thing. <laughs> I lit the fuse and tossed the dynamite out the window. <laughs> a tiny, tiny version of it flew out the window of the model car in the seat next to me. I braced myself. <laughs> they all blew at once, and I saw stars, cartoon stars and spirals. When the dust settled, I was back where I'd started, at the wheel of my Buick in the soft tech parking lot, the crazed plastic steering wheel. A square of sunlight lay on my lap, heavy and insistent. I turned the ignition to on and fired up the big V8. I guess I'll just read some of Chapter 2. My wife Nancy had just given birth to our second child, another girl. The new baby had the colic and cried a lot at night. As our first girl wasn't even two years old yet, Nancy really had her hands full. Her mother had come to stay and help out for a few months. A mixed blessing. <laughs> When I pulled into the driveway, old Mom Mom was out in the front yard flailing at something with my fishing rod. She was holding the rod by the tip and slamming the reel down into the ground. <laughs> Quick, Josie, she cried, poison toad. Mom Mom Brug had her own distinctive set of words. Something moved in the grass and she whipped my rod back for a real knockout punch. The fiberglass snapped and the beast with the reel flew over to crash on my Buick's shiny hood. I got out of the car and tried to just walk up past her. I was definitely ripe for my Friday afternoon beer. But Mom, almost, Mom, Mom was too fast for me. She put herself between me and the house. Careful, Josie! She pointed with the tip of my broken fishing rush. It almost bit Serena. I gave a heavy sigh and went over to look. Sure enough, there was some kind of little animal scrambling about in my long, unmown tussocks. From what glimpses I could catch, the creature seemed to be gray with white spots on its head and Three guesses who, and the first two don't count. I think I know what it is, my mom. It's nothing for you to worry about. But just listen to your poor little girl. Serena, my one and a half year old, was indeed crying. But this was not so unusual. Serena liked to cry. It was something she did well. <laughs> bad, she screamed from the front steps. Bad, bad, bad. I squatted down by the bad invader. One of his feet was sticking out from under the plantain. I turned over the leaf, and there, just as I'd expected, was little Harry. What do you want now? You didn't go to the bank, Fletch. You forgot to get the money out for me. You want me to stomp on you, Harry? <laughs> just say the word, man. <laughs> you better be there tomorrow. Again, he disappeared with that peculiar dwindling effect. I scuffed at the spot where he'd been, then turned to face Mrs. Brew. Let's go in and have a drink, Mom Mom. It's happy hour. 3.36, strictly speaking. Baby Violet's after-nap cry sounded from the house. Force and jerky, the cry had a wholly different quality from Serena's practice wins. I'll get the baby, offered my mom, and then yes, Josie, an old-fashioned would be nice. Be sure to offer Nancy something if she's feeling poorly. I found Nancy flaked out on her double bed with a stack of old People magazines and an overflowing ashtray. God, Joey, when am I going to feel normal again? stitches are killing me in my back. Yeah, I'm going nuts myself. I thought I saw Harry in the car, and then the car was like inside itself. My back feels like it's broken. 
You think you could rub it a little? If you move the airstream. Could you close the door, Joe? Okay. My mother's been driving me up the wall. She keeps talking about what my father would do if he were here. Oh, God. I'm going to go see Harry tomorrow. I think he's invented something new. Don't give him money, Joseph. I mean it. We need that money for our Christmas vacation. What vacation? Don't you ever listen to anything I tell you? Look, I'm going to get a beer. You want one? How about that back row? Nancy was lying on her stomach. I sat down on the backs of her legs and worked my fingers up and down her spine. My woman. She smelled pleasantly of sweat and milk. How's baby Violet? Oh, fine. She smiled this morning. Someone was fumbling at the bedroom door. Serena. Just a minute, sweetie. Does that feel better, Nancy? A little. Could you do something with Serena? She's been feeling left out. This morning when I was nursing, she came over and bit my arm. What a brat. But she's poor. Be nice to her. Unable to turn the knob, Serena began thumping on the door. Dada, 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 dada. Here I come, little pig. I'm going to cook you in a pot. When I opened the door, Serena squealed and toddled off at high speed. I followed her into the kitchen and popped the top on a bud. One thing about Mrs. Brew is she kept the fridge well stocked. I inhaled the first beer and started the second. That regress had been bad news. In a way, it had taken place outside of time. I wondered what would have happened if I'd, ring, if I'd wrung the neck of the thumb-sized Fletcher. The giant would have done the same to me, of course, while being choked himself and, uh, uh, uh. Hall of Mirrors. Hard to see any applications there, <laughs> though time travel could obviously be a gold mine. There's a new state lottery where you can pick your own numbers. I got out the phone book and looked under Appliances Repair. Harry had taken over the family business when his father died last winter. I'd never seen the place yet. The ad was pure Harry. It's like an ad in the yellow pages. So there's a slogan at the top. Don't think, we don't think, don't think, don't. Can I hear that again? Don't think, we don't think, don't think, don't. Okay. <laughs> Robotics and appliance repair. Gerber Cybernetics, 20 years at the same location. Yes, we buy for cash. 846-3555-501 Suey Dam Street, New Brunswick. Cybernetics. That was a word we'd always laughed about. Nobody has any idea what it means. It's just some crazy word Norbert Wiener made up. <laughs> Gerber Cybernetics. I dialed the number. Remember when I was looking for a job, I used to tell people I was an expert on cybernetics. <laughs> so you can always say that with complete safety. <laughs> <laughs> I dialed the number. Hello? An old woman's questioning quaver. This is Joseph Fletcher. Is Mr. Gerber in? I'll get him. Harry? There were footsteps, the sound of breaking glass, a curse, a woman yelling. The person at the other end knocked the phone off the counter, then picked it up. Hello? Harry, what do you have? I lowered my voice so that Nancy wouldn't hear me. I can spare two grand, but no more. Who's this? He sounded confused. In the background, his mother was still yelling. Who's this? Who do you think it is, space cadet? Is this Joe Fletcher? Look, you'll be open tomorrow, right? We're open 10 to 5 on Saturdays. Okay, I'll come in early and we can have lunch together, like businessmen. Do you have any circuit diagrams for the thing? You want me to invent something? I thought you already had it. Master of space and time, right? I don't know what you're talking about, Fletch. Are you drunk? This was getting nowhere fast. If the little Harry's had been from the future, then maybe he really didn't know what I was talking about. You're going to invent a time machine, I explained. We can use it to win the state lottery. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Not time machines again. <laughs> There's no such thing, Fletcher. How many times do I have to explain it to you? Time machines are logically impossible. But sure, come on over. I mean, I could use $2,000. <laughs> <laughs> For what? Hold on. There are voices in the back end. Yes, it's ready. Fletcher, I'm going to have to hang up. Customers, see you tomorrow. Serena had climbed onto my lap while I was talking. She was about as short as you could be and still walking. <laughs> I planted a kiss on her fat little cheek. Good girl. Good big girl. Daddy's big Serena. Da da hand. She starfished her little paw against my palm. Serena hand. I looked around our shabby kitchen. Plastic chairs and the paint coming off <laughs> the ceiling. I wished I'd spent, I'd spent some money on good furniture when I'd been rich. My three girls deserved better than this. I sat down Serena and got up to fix my mom and Nancy their drink. Okay, 
Yes, that's chapter 2. Here's chapter 3. Uh, I wrote chapter 3 today. So I, I have no idea what happens. But maybe afterwards you can make some suggestions. I used to do that at Randolph Macon. Instead of teaching calculus. <laughs> <laughs> I got Don't give me ideas. <laughs> 3. Saturday was cool and rainy. I stopped by my bank and drove to New Brunswick. Harry's shop was in a crummy neighborhood near the train station. There was a bus station, too, and next to it was a place called the Terminal Bar. Some terminal-type guys slumped past in the wet, one of them a cripple leaning on a mechanical walker. Where's Gerber Cybernetics, I asked him. Gerber Appliance? Right up there. The shop had a big plate glass window, a dirty window crowded with junk, which included a plastic pig wearing a crown, a cardboard box full of saxophone parts, a girly calendar from the Rigid Tool Company, a floppy heap of fan that's a real company, the Rigid Tool. A floppy <laughs> heap of fan belts, a typewriter with the cover off, a stack of old science fiction magazines, and a coiled up orange extension cord. The letters Gerber Appliance arced across one window, but with the appliance only a pale scraped off shadow. In place of it crudely brushed in was the new designation, Cybernetics. I opened the door and went on in, feeling like a 12-year-old come to play with his best friend's train. The front of the shop was cramped, with a waist-high counter and a partition dividing it from the actual work area in the rear. A robot stood behind the counter, watching me alertly. It was a multi-purpose Q89 with a small bullet-shaped head and long snaky arms. This is set, you know, like 1990. It's actually the theme of him feeling like a 12-year-old come to play with his best friend. That's sort of like the mindset where a lot of science fiction is coming from. Right? I mean, people always talk about the golden age of science fiction, you know, back when it was really good. But some guy once said, the go they used to say, well, it was the 1940s, the 1950s. Some guy once said, the golden age of science fiction is between 12 and 14. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's a nice time. So here he comes in, there's the robot behind the counter. What can we do you for? And the robot was programmed to sound like a friendly old woman. Over the phone, I'd taken it for Harry's mother. I'm Joe Fletcher. Mr. Gerber's expecting me. You can call me Auntie, said the robot. A-M-T-I-E. Harry's in fact. Thank you, Auntie. She, it, stepped aside, and I went through the door behind the counter. There was a regular workshop back there with shelves of parts and numerous partially assembled electronic devices. The resinous tang of solder smoke perfumed the air. I felt right at home. Harry looked up from a TV chassis with a big smile. Fletcher! It's been a long time. I've been busy with the job and the kids, Harry. Great to see you. I took another look around the crowded workroom. So this is your dad's business, eh? You making any money? Not enough. My mother's in the hospital. Sorry to hear that. Your robot, Auntie, sounds just like her. Yeah, that's so the old customers aren't surprised when they phone up. My mother programmed Auntie to act just like her, too. I keep meaning to change it, but I don't know. It's sort of soothing. But what was that phone call of yours all about? Before I could really start, I was interrupted by Auntie. Would you like some soup, Mr. Fletcher? The robot shuffled into the room, bearing a tray with two steaming bowls of thick, dark metal soup. Well, I'd really been planning to take Harry out for lunch. You two can still go out. It won't hurt my feelings. I'm just a machine. <laughs> Should I put some quark food in that, Harry? Quark food, I asked. It's like sour cream, Harry said with a laugh. In Hungary, quark means just that, sour cream. My mother's Hungarian, and they always put sour cream in their metal soup. Try it. It's delicious. Okay. Auntie served us our soup with quark food and, at Harry's urging, went out to the terminal bar for a couple of six-packs. I told Harry about my experiences of the day before. The details that interested him the most were the ones having to do with the infinite regress. Matter is infinitely divisible, Fletcher. That's what the real Hefcats have been saying for 20 years. Wheeler, Kenneth Wilson, Feinberg, Al-Haraz. An electron is made up of an electron plus a photon. A particle is like an endless taproot, digging down into ultimate reality with infinitely many root hairs branching off. The electron splits into a new electron plus a photon, and you can 
split again to get a deeper electron plus two photons, which splits to an electron plus photon plus photon plus photon. Everything is infinite if you just look hard enough. That's what you've been working on? After a fashion. You don't remember coming to see me yesterday? Are you sure that stick of dynamite wasn't wacky weed? I repair robots and fix TVs. I'm over the hill, Fletch. I haven't done anything really good in months. You've been through phases like that before, Harry. It just means you're regrouping. Tell me more about this infinite regress stuff. What can I say? Space in this is an illusion. The world's a collective dream, a statistical average of what people think it is. What the atoms think matters too, of course. Atoms are alive, Fletcher. Do you feel anything? I was feeling a little big-headed. As I'd eaten my soup and pork food, I'd been feeling more and more able to follow Harry's thought processes. I picked up the little dish of thick white quark food and stared at it. This, I said, this is not right. On the beam, Harry's <laughs> core speech is broadened with mirth. I just made that crap this morning. Pick a number between 1 and 1,000. And you'll guess it? I can guess it. 248, right? This so-called quark food is an exotic compound made up of real quarks, EPR, EPR coupled quark pairs. My number was 37. <laughs> <laughs> but do amplify. Quarks, as in sub-elementary particles, EPR coupled, this is all complete bullshit. EPR coupled quark pairs stay in sync like dancers on opposite sides of a ballroom. <laughs> Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen had the basic idea in 1935. I figured that if two people would eat some of it together, they'd get a little telepathy going. And as you're such a good friend, I decided to try it on me. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> I stared down at my stomach, half expecting to see it glow. It's the same basic idea as Holy Communion, Fletcher. The Eucharist. People eat things together, and then their bodies are sort of connected by the world lives of wheat and grapes. Companion in French is cold pain with bread. That's why married couples understand each other so well. After about seven years eating together, they're made of exactly the same material. <laughs> Quark food's just a little faster. <laughs> now you're wondering how to make money off it. Am I right? <laughs> um, yeah. I really need to be able to quit my job, Harry. They treat me like anyone else. It's just horrible. <laughs> I pause, trying to catch my breath. Some oily sex fantasies filtered through my mind. Harry's, for sure. <laughs> you seeing anyone, Harry? Well, there's this one girl called Petsy. She works at the terminal bar sometimes. Only I'm worried maybe she's a man in drag. A she-male is what they're called. Men with silicone breasts and plastic surgery. It's a whole subculture here. And I still see one of the teachers from the Collegiate Academy, Sandra Tupperware. Nobody's called Tupperware, you fat liar. It occurred to me that in all probability, the quark food was really just sour cream. Harry likes to play tricks on me. Has anything you've told me yet been true, Harry? Well, like Pilot said, what is true? I wash my hands. <laughs> Your number is 37. <laughs> of course, he's already told it. <laughs> he leaned back in his chair and laughed. Here's your beer, boys. And he reappeared with the beer. We each opened one. I drank deep and sighed with pleasure. Drinking beer in a back room on a rainy Saturday. This is the life, Harry. At home, I've got my mother-in-law and two babies in diapers. But you've got Nancy, too. I'd rather have Nancy than a robot or Sandra Tupperware. You don't believe me? I'll phone her up. I'd rather meet Petsy. Later. When the beer runs out. Did I hear you say you brought me money? $2,000. Venture capital. Well, I think the quark food idea really would work, but I'd need some laboratory-grade quarkonium to test it. And that stuff costs, like, millions. Well, what good is telepathy anyway, Harry? I mean, people can just as well write each other letters or use the telephone. Though, you know, you had me going for a minute there. That's an interesting point in itself. The world is what you think it is. I have this idea that if I could just think the right thought, then I'd be able to control reality. But people have been trying to do that forever, Harry. Magic, voodoo, positive thinking. It's all just empty fantasy. No one person can control the universe. That may have been true for guys using chicken guts and nail clippings, but I've got this idea of an actual gadget to sort of amplify my thoughts. It has to do with the infinite divisibility of matter. The world is infinite in both scale directions, up and down. Like the vision I had yesterday. Before you said it was real, and now you say it was a vision. Are you sure there's a difference? That's the whole secret. I mean, you do have control over your thoughts, don't you? If you could somehow, like, slide down a notch, then the real world would be like thoughts, too. You think you know how to do it? I have an idea. <coughs> Science
science is really a lot like magic, Fletch. It's just that we use more complicated potions. You have the money with you? <coughs> yeah. Let's go shopping. So, now they have to put together a machine or something. <coughs> Science fiction, you always expect the machine. <coughs> it is funny about the machines. Uh, yeah. I mean, it really is sort of the same thing that like a witch doctor does. They'll get like special stones, and so we'll get like silicon and chips, and then they'll get like you know potions, vegetable potions. So we'll get special chemicals. You know, they'll hook it up to some kind of power source. So we'll get like a mixture of acids to make electricity. And you know, they'll expect to hear spirit voices and we get radio. They don't want to fly and we get airplanes. <coughs> so, I mean it's funny that, that anything that we can do with science does work at all. Uh, it, it's interesting to, to think about there being somehow some level of science which is to what we we now have, you know, as what we now have is to like the witch doctor stuff. There um uh, there, there is some hope that they'll, they'll be able to do some real neat stuff with quarks. In all my stories now, I always use quarks. In the 40s, uh, people would always talk about radioactivity. You know? Like when you didn't know how, when you needed to run an anti-gravity device or a time machine, you use radioactivity. You know? But that's not too sexy a concept anymore. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's, whenever I use a science fiction story, whenever I need some machine, I always use quarks. It amazes me though, like I made up this word, quarconium. And then a year later, in the Scientific American, they had a big article, quarconium. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it doesn't exactly do what I expect. <laughs> <laughs> Well, when I was growing up, 
I guess there'd be uh, maybe three, I guess. When I was a kid, the one I read was Robert Heinlein. And probably most people writing science fiction today must have started there. In a sense, you could almost say he invented the field. You know? <coughs> he wrote what, what they call juvenile novels, which are novels with no sex, drugs, and bad language. I've always wanted to write a book like that. <laughs> Never quite pulled it off. And uh, so I read those. And then, uh, of course, I, I mean, he's really gone. He's no good at all. He's well fooled. But he, I mean, he was a great writer then, but you shouldn't waste money. On <laughs> By mine, instead. Uh, but then another guy that had a big influence on me was Robert Shacklett. He was a story, short story writer in Shacklett. And he never really got the reputation he deserved. Although he's, I don't know. I mean, if you're a connoisseur of science fiction, you've heard of him. He's, he's really good. And another writer that I really didn't get into until I started writing science fiction was Phil Dick, Philip K. Dick. And where people have heard of him most recently was they had a movie based on his books this summer called Blade Runner. And uh, so he wrote like 50 novels, and all very interesting. And stylistically, I'm probably, at this point, I'm probably more like Phil Dick than I am like any other science fiction writer. Because he, he had the same tendency to combine fragments of his real life with fantastic reality changes and uh, metaphysical concepts or scientific concepts. And that, that is usually more or less what I'm trying to do. I like to you know, take, take my own life, sort of fracture it and shuffle it, and combine it with various ideas that I've had. So in a way, uh, Phil Dick is, is pretty close to that. What was under the manhole in the white line? Uh, what was under the manhole in the white line? Well, maybe I should explain his question. There's this guy in this book, he spends all the time trying to get to the top of this infinitely high mountain where the white light is. It's sort of like God. But then he has this dream and he meets God. Then he know he's talking to God and he notices there's a wire that leads out of God's back that goes into this manhole in the floor. Right? Well, it's it's indescribable. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's where zero equals one or zero equals infinity. It's uh is this a pure undifferentiated nothingness. I wonder if he had any idea. Well, I I do sort of. I mean, it's just, it's a little hard to express what's in there. In other words, there's a concept that comes before you say anything. It's sort of like that. Just yeah. Well, she wasn't that interesting. <laughs> she wanted to know where they were going to live. Or another way to describe what was in the hole, if you ever pay attention to your thoughts, uh, or you start observing your thoughts, there's like spaces in between your thoughts. And that's what's in there. 